If British cinema has a home, it's not Pinewood, it's not Shepperton, it's a slightly manky patch of land in central London, Leicester Square. The movies set up home here almost as soon as they were invented, when Queen Victoria was on the stamps. But what you wouldn't have seen here in 1896 is a cinema. Cinema, the art form, has been with us for over 11 decades. But cinemas, the places where films live, haven't yet reached their century. Leicester Square used to be where you found some of Britain's biggest music halls. When cinema first came to Leicester Square, it was just another novelty act, like people who wrestled alligators. It was a great clattering machine that juggled rolls of celluloid and showed you a view of Venice or of a train leaving a station. But in just a few years, it had caused the demolition of music halls and palaces of varieties. It had sent dancing girls and comics to the labour exchange. And soon, cinema was the only show on this square. The first films were shown anywhere you could put up a few chairs and a big white sheet. Not just variety theatres, but empty shops and skating rinks and fairground tents next to the coconut shy. By 1910, however, the first cinema buildings were being constructed. Here, finally, was a bricks-and-mortar temple to the power of the cinematograph. This was a building that said, movies aren't just a passing fad, like ether-sniffing or hooped skirts. Movies are here to stay. Electric palaces appeared across the country. This one in Harwich was built by an East Anglian travelling showman, Charles Thurston. Before he called in the brickies and plasterers, Harwich folk would probably have caught a film in one of his tents. Well, it was either that or something morally improving at the Salvation Army Citadel. But if you'd have been here on the opening night of the Electric in 1911, you could have seen an Admiral Nelson double bill. Well, there were a lot of sailors round here, you see. The builders of the Electric Palace didn't waste their hard-earned cash on extravagances like staircases. A ladder gets the staff up to the projection room. And if you were a film can, you could use the winch on the right. Bricks and mortar cinemas had become a necessity. Indeed, they'd been called for by an act of parliament because film was a hazard to public health. The nitrate, which was a crucial ingredient of early film stock, was terribly flammable. So if somebody chucked a fag butt in a tent, it would have been curtains for everyone. But not if you were projecting films from a room like this. The booth still has the metal shutters, which were designed to be pulled down if a reel of film became too hot to handle. The auditorium today looks pretty much as it did when people sat here watching Buster Keaton and Felix the Cat. But for many years, it was no more than a derelict shell, until some local enthusiasts came to the rescue with their shovels and their paintbrushes. It closed in 1956. By 1972, it was in a really sorry state. There was a stench of dead cats. There was uh, water, uh, sort of sodden chairs all over the place. And the first thing that had to be done was to repair the enormous hole in the roof because the, the rain was just pouring in. I well remember uh, ripping up uh, old floorboards and carting seats out, and we were very fortunate that we had two recently retired plasterers uh, with great skill who could put back the fine plaster work. The palace is now one of the earliest cinemas in the country, still being used for its original purpose. There's an old story that says that people who worked on the Harwich docks were obliged to enter the cinema via a side entrance so that the patrons in the more expensive seats would remain unmolested by the smell of herrings and bilge. It's apocryphal, of course, but it's certainly true that usherettes would go up and down the aisles here, spraying people with perfume disinfectant. Edwardian cinema would have been rich with the smell of Jay's fluid, cigarettes and B.O. Films alone wouldn't keep the palace twinkling today. It's still here, simply because the people of Harwich have decided that its presence makes their town a better place to live. It's constantly appealing for money, but then it wasn't very profitable back in the 1920s either. 
The cinema going became a national obsession. Far bigger venues were needed. Venues like this one in South London. No one watches films here now, so it has to turn other tricks to pay its way. But then movies were only ever one of the attractions it offered. This was once a Granada, part of the cinema chain set up by an Essex boy called Sidney Bernstein. His old dad had built a music hall and some of the first picture palaces, but Sidney had bigger ideas than that. In the 20s, he went to America and came back with a vision of a new kind of cinema, a cinema that offered a total experience. The movies were supposed to transport you to a fantasy world, but what if you were already there from the moment you walked into the foyer? And so, a mock Gothic Spanish cathedral came to be designed by a former director of the Bolshoi Ballet, crafted by Italian artisans and deposited on Tooting High Street. No dingy corridors at the Granada, instead the circle is reached through a hall of mirrors. Here, they could seat over 3,000 people for three shows a day, Monday through Sunday. That's up to 63,000 bums on seats a week. And they needed cheering up. It was the 1930s. There was a depression on, a great one. You were sort of transported as soon as you came to the door. You were in another world. My, my mother always knew if I'd been to the cinema because I was always very humpy when I came home. She said, you've been to the pictures, haven't you? I said, yeah because I'd come out of there, that beautiful world, and I'd come home to humdrum, steamy washing around the fire. Oh, it was gorgeous, it was, it was packed, it was always packed. So who came here, who visited here? What stars came here when it was a cinema? John Wayne came, Jane Mansfield came, Eddie Fisher came, Elsie and Doris Waters. What do you remember about Jane Mansfield? All the figure, beautiful, she was beautiful. I was more excited about Tyrone Power, it was handsome than he was. He stood on the balcony outside and the crowds were all outside shouting for him, you know. And at the time when neighbours here, I was usherette and we used to have to stand on the steps there and be uh, looked at every day before we went on parade. We were very smart, very smart. We had blue trousers, a gold blouse with three gold and blue buttons and a cape and the hat we used to have on the side, like a sailor's hat. It's a complete replica of the uh, Alhambra Palace in Granada. And I always said that if I ever got the chance to go to Granada in Spain, I would. And I did go there. And I think, actually, that uh, the Granada in Spain came off second best to this. The Tooting Granada even had a resident 20-piece orchestra, and since it looked like a church, they stuck a dirty great organ in it. In the early 70s, this mightiest of mighty Wurlitzers was flooded with sewage, then entombed under the bingo caller's tank of skittering balls. But in an underground lair, an enthusiast has been trying to give it the kiss of life. The sound of the organ, of course, not an electronic instrument, this is a pipe organ. And so why are the pipes? Standing right behind you, um, you see a series of what we call shutters, and these open and close, and uh, you can just about see a few pipes inside. Oh, right, okay. I can see hundreds That's of them, it looks like. How many, how many are behind there? Oh, well, it's over 1,500 pipes, something like that. Many people asked, will it ever play again into the theatre? Will the console ever come up from the depths? With any luck, we might just be able to get it through the floor for the first time in 33 years while you're here. So Fantastic. if you're prepared to take the chance... Does that mean I can have a ride? Any time you like. Let's go. <laughs> As I sensed Len's organ rising beneath me, I knew I was privileged to be among the first to have a go on it.
That's fantastic. So listen, when audiences were coming here to hear the organ played, it was part of a big live show, wasn't it? Well, in the very early days, they were used for silent picture accompaniment. You know, they took the place of uh, cinema pianists and indeed orchestras at times. You know, once Al Johnson came in, and the sound movies came in, um, the organ then took on the role of being a solo instrument during the ice cream interval and playing a march to march everybody out. So what happened to them all then? Because this is quite a rare survival, this, isn't it? Well, come the sort of 1960s, 70s, um, their era was truly over and cinemas were being changed uh, in their format and uh, they became redundant, the theatre organists were laid off and they were largely put to bed, mothballed, you might say. By the 1950s, not even whopping great pipes and cod gothic spandrels could compete with the new rival to film. Television didn't offer you opulence, but it did offer you entertainment without the obligation of getting off your bottom. Sidney Bernstein saw what was coming, and he turned Granada into a television company. He wasn't sentimental about cinema, and he certainly wasn't sentimental about money. And by 1973, this place wasn't making any. He decided to call in the wrecking balls and flog the land. At the last minute, though, the building was saved by being listed. It's the only cinema in Britain to be rated Grade 1. It's as protected from the bulldozers as St Paul's Cathedral. And soon after, the Tooting Granada experienced a resurrection, thanks to the same saviour that offered life after death to many other old cinemas. 7, 2, 72. 1 and 5, 15. 8 and 4, 84. Until 1960, bingo was what you did at Butlins when it was too wet for a glamorous grandmother competition by the Olympic-sized swimming pool. But then it was legalised as a commercial activity and clickety-click, just seven years later, bingo halls were receiving 260 million annual admissions, already 10 million more than were turning up at the flickers. So what kind of chat do you use then? What about the um, two fat ladies and the clickety -click Not allowed and all anymore. That? Completely outlawed. Not allowed? Outlawed? Not PC, By whom? It? It's not PC, is it, two fat ladies? Clickety-click, there's nothing un-PC about clickety -click, click isn't there? You need to show me how it's done now. OK, so you just press the green button and it all starts up. Yep, press the green button. Yep, yep. Six and eight. Uh, 68. That's, that so, good? that's that good? so cheesy. Was that a bit old school? <laughs> that, was, that was like Wesby Balls. <laughs> <laughs> ah, now, <Droopy> 44. <laughs> Droopy draws. <laughs> uh, 44. <laughs> 46. On its own, nine. I could get into this, but I'm not sure it'd be a good long-term career move. Attendance at bingo clubs has been falling for years. It's more than halved since the mid-1970s. So bingo is facing the same kind of crisis that the movies faced in the 60s and 70s. But just as they did when cinema audiences collapsed, these buildings will survive. The question is, who will their next occupants be? Who's going to be having fun here in 50 years' time? 8 and 4, 84. 7 and 1, 71. There's even talk of running a few movie screenings here again. Maybe things are about to turn full circle at the Tooting Granada. But elsewhere, there are signs of another possible future for film. As cinemas turned into bingo halls and flats and shops and pubs and clubs, films have had to look for new homes elsewhere. Mainly, they moved in with us in the form of video and DVD. And we've been pretty happy together, haven't we? That makes it all the more challenging to build a new home for films in the 21st century. But that's what they've tried to do here. This is the British Film Institute's newly refurbished pad on London's South Bank. No churchy woodwork here, it's all very shiny and cool. Oh yeah, and as well as a lot of glass and steel, there's a new sort of space for watching moving pictures. It's called a mediatek, that's a French word like kinematograph. 
No longer do you sit in a big crowd of people all watching the same thing. Instead, you choose whatever you fancy watching from a computerised list of thousands of titles in the National Film and Television Archive. Anything from silent movies to Monty Python. You view them in your private booth with an individual screen. There's no one sitting in your way, no butter-kissed ads. And the fools don't charge you a penny to use it. The BFI will roll out similar facilities in towns across the UK. In some ways, this returns cinema to the circumstances of its birth. There's something of the fairground booth about the Mediatek. This is a kind of Nickelodeon machine, and that, I suppose, is the crank. For years, cinemas got bigger and bigger and bigger. But maybe the age of the Dream Palace was just a kind of blip. Maybe the future of cinema is more intimate, dinkier. In the early days, when they'd set up home together, film and cinemas seemed as inseparable as guys and dolls. Since then, they've learned to live more independent lives. That's not a twist many people saw coming, but it's still a sort of happy ending. <laughs>